the talk I'm presenting today is work that I did for um, an IEEE conference this year on the legacy of Norbert Wiener in the 21st century. My doctoral work dealt in part with the impact of cybernetics on literary thinking. So the writings of Norbert Wiener, um, a mathematician and information theorist and the founder of cybernetics uh, in the 1940s played a large role in that project of mine. And for that reason, when I was asked to present on a conference at a conference on Norbert Wiener's scientific vision and how it's relevant today, um, it really left with the chance to do that. One aspect of Norbert Wiener's thinking that I always found especially prescient was his description of what would be at stake or what would be demanded in order to develop machine learning for complex tasks. Um, some of Wiener's already realized predictions have to do with the impacts of automation on society. Machine learning itself is a form of automation. But when we think about machine learning in a general social non-technical way, we usually think of the automation of tasks. Um, in other words, so we think more about the machine uh, in machine learning than the learning in machine learning. In some ways, we might consider automation as even an antonym for learning. Automation repeats while learning adapts. In Norbert Wiener's work, when he wants to think about this paradox of automating the process of learning in machines, um, he sees games as a way to bridge the gap. So this aspect of Wiener's thinking is what I wanted to understand. Um, and the talk that follows here is some of this work in linking contemporary issues in machine learning to Wiener's work with games, learning, and automation. More specifically, there's one figure that Norbert Wiener uses consistently across his work from the 1940s through the 1960s um, to represent this nexus of issues, and that is the figure of the golem. Hence the title of my talk, <clears throat> The Golem and the Game of Automation. Appearing in 1964, in the year of his death, Norbert Wiener's final book raised some provocative notions in its very title, God and Gollum Incorporated, a, con a comment on certain aspects where cybernetics impinges on religion. This short book, containing some of Wiener's more philosophical writings on the problem of machine learning, was posthumously awarded the prestigious National Book Award in 1965, after he died. Coming at the end of a long and enormously influential career that spanned from quantum physics and ballistics engineering to biology, information theory, and founding that interdisciplinary field that I referred to, cybernetics. Um, Wiener's God and Gollum Incorporated represents his final speculations regarding the future of computation, automation, and artificial intelligence, the horizons of which Wiener's own work had helped to shape. From the mid-1940s until his death, Wiener had worked tirelessly to synthesize these various technologies and endeavors under the unified heading of cybernetics. Here in this final text, however, Wiener constructs a rhetorical golem to allegorize the inherent risks of this technological synthesis. Wiener views machine learning as a genuinely creative activity, one akin to creating life, and thus fraught with all the attendant dangers of such an endeavor. One question that Wiener continued to wonder about was, can machines learn meaningfully at a human level without first being granted an equally meaningful freedom. Today, over half a century later, Wiener's God and Gollum Incorporated remains relevant to contemporary machine learning and reinforcement learning research about which we'll later. Wiener's Gollum AI addresses the value alignment problems raised by these researchers in their attempts to create autonomous artificial agents that can learn useful policies or 
plans, procedures, and criteria for action, while avoiding endangering humans and human systems in the process. Wiener regards machine learning in his own day as the modern counterpart to the golem of the rabbi of Prague. And he contrasts the golem's literal mindedness to the flexible and adaptive learning of which humans are capable. In God and Gollum Incorporated, Wiener seeks not to oppose machine learning researchers, but rather to caution them. For Wiener, the horizon of existential threat lies in the future reproduction of machines by machines themselves. In Wiener's view, this machinic self-creativity will have its origin not in a goal, but in a game. Wiener frames the most fundamental problem arising from the construction of artificial agents as the problem of the game between the creator and a creature. Wiener made careful study of the game playing computers of his time. His observation of these early game playing computers was that they tended to absorb uncannily the gaming personality of their opponents. This personality, in other words, um, was learnt in fundamental opposition to their creators. Wiener's thinking about automation and its future dwells on this concept of the adversarial game. And he brings it to bear on the problem of learning for machine and human alike. In his final book, the question Wiener poses to the AI researchers of the future is, can God play a significant game with his own creature? Why is the golem used by Wiener as the figure for this game playing creature? What does Wiener mean by this game of automation and creation? Today, it is more urgent than ever to explore this question's relevance to the contemporary context of machine learning research. But before turning to the field of reinforcement learning, it will be important to understand the very specific history that Wiener has in mind when he activates the allegory of the golem. What is a golem? Well, the history of this legendary and ultimately religious figure stretches back many centuries. The figure of the golem from the 19th century onward has frequently been mobilized to depict technology out of control. Winner's own golem, however, and this is something I want to argue here, has its roots in two particular sources. The first is the work of Wiener's father, Leo Wiener, born in 1862, died in 1939. Leo Wiener was a Jewish immigrant fleeing the anti-Semitism and pogroms of Imperial Russia, um, eventually immigrating to the United States. A polyglot and self-made man, Leo Wiener went on to an academic career. Uh, he served as the first ever professor of Slavic literature in America, and he helped to establish the Department of Slavic Languages and Literatures at Harvard University, the same department that Roman Jakobson would eventually um, make quite a career in. Leo Wiener's many books include uh, The History of Yiddish Literature in the 19th Century, published in 1899. This is a book of particular interest because in this book, an early version of the Gollum story is described in the following way. One of the Gaons at Vilna, that's Vilnius, Lithuania, was possessed of the miraculous power to create a golem, a homunculus. It was a vivified clay man who had to do the bidding of him who had given him temporary life. Whenever his mission was fulfilled, he was turned back into an unrecognizable mass of clay. Leo Wiener's discussion of the golem in Yiddish literature 
acknowledges its earliest origins in rabbinical writings, concerned not with ungovernable proto-robots, but rather with spiritual ethics. Indeed, ethical questions surrounding the creation of non-human autonomous agents predate our own age of AI by many centuries. It is this specific genealogy that we see in Leo's son, Norbert Wiener, in his writings about the golem at the dawn of machine birth. Norbert Wiener's golem is a figure not of ungovernable technology, but rather of technology that impinges on religion, as the title of his final book attests. Indeed, while Norbert Wiener's God and Golem Incorporated contains his final statement about the Golem of cybernetics, Wiener's first book length treatise, the field defining volume Cybernetics or Control and Communication in the Animal and the Machine from 1948, might be familiar to people in the audience, already raises the specter of the Golem in connection to machinic creation. Wiener writes, at every stage of technique since Daedalus or Hero of Alexandria, the ability of the artificer to produce a working simulacra of a living organism has always intrigued people. In the days of magic, we have the bizarre and sinister concept of the golem, that figure of clay into which the rabbi of Prague breathed in life with the blasphemy of the ineffable name of God. It's from cybernetics. Despite explicitly referencing the secular version of the Prague Golem, Wiener's emphasis here on blasphemy and the ineffable name of God indicates his deeper training in the religious dimensions of this legend. Deriving his thinking about the spiritual dimensions of the Golem legend, originally from his father's erudition. And just to note, um, Norbert Wiener was homeschooled by his father, Leo Wiener, for, for many years. So there was a lot of opportunity for this really direct um, transmission, father to son. Norbert Wiener's Gollum, I want to suggest, uh, draws much less from secular science fiction, uh, as we might assume, um, than it does from a Jewish religious and contextual history we see this intertextual history of the golem as well in the writings of Wiener's intellectual contemporary, Gershom Sholem. Sholem, as a historian of Jewish thought, wrote a definitive essay on the history of the golem. Uh, this first appeared in 1953 and later formed uh, one chapter in Sholem's On the Kabbalah and Its Symbolism, um, published in 18, sorry, 1965. Uh, in English, just after Wiener's God and Gollum. In this essay, The Idea of the Gollum, Sholem relates a particular version of the Gollum story that parallels the one told by Wiener. Namely, the version written down by students of Rabbi Judah, the pious of Spire, uh, died in 1217 in Regensburg, this account from the 13th century describes how two students of the Sefer Yetzirah, the Book of Creation, an important Kabbalistic text, use their studies to create a humanoid on whose forehead stood Emmet, as on Adam's forehead. Emmet means truth, uh, and it implies the essence of divinity or divine power. Here, um, by their imitation of God's creative act, the inscription of Emmet and its performative powers becomes heretical. Against this heresy, the newly created humanoid golem suddenly turns and addresses its inventors. The golem admonishes them for placing this divine inscription on its forehead. This is what Wiener calls the blasphemy of the ineffable name. In this version of the story, not only does the golem reprimand its human creators, the golem also imparts a solution to the heresy, to this heretical event. The golem says, or commands its inventors thus, erase the aleph of the word emmet 
from my forehead. Erasing Aleph renders the heretical inscription Emmet as met or dead. On doing this, the golem, on having this letter erased, the golem immediately fell into dust. Recounting this story, Shalom interpretively clarifies that the danger is not that the golem become autonomous, would develop overwhelming powers. It lies in the tension which the creative process arouses in the creator. Humanity's reduplication of divine creation by building autonomous agents thus inaugurates specific ethical and spiritual dangers with impacts on the creators themselves. Mistakes in carrying out the directions do not impair the golem. They destroy its creator, Shalom stresses. Okay, so let's turn from this context to the topic of reinforcement learning. Wiener's golem raises issues of continuing relevance to modern day machine learning research. Traditional machine learning techniques derive their power from the processing of myriad examples, training data, using technologies such as artificial neural networks to achieve pattern recognition and prediction through forms of supervised learning or to generate descriptions for data on supervised learning. While supervised learning that propagates error signals through a neural network to guide future identification of patterns in data, unsupervised learning suggests appropriate models and representations for the data that is presented to it. Reinforcement learning's method differs fundamentally from both of these forms of machine learning. So reinforcement learning is a species of machine learning. Um, in that where traditional machine learning learns to identify, classify, and describe data, reinforcement learning learns to act on the data. Reinforcement learning is guided by a policy that the agent learns in the process of interacting with an environment in a goal-directed way. Reinforcement learning agents work according to fixed reward functions that register the intrinsic desirability of any given state in their environment. The reinforcement learning agent's main imperative is to maximize this reward, so to maximize the rewards in their environment. It learns through maximizing these rewards in its environment rather than obeying or following a pre-given policy. And so this reinforcement learning agent has to learn how to balance both exploring its environment and exploiting the rewards in its environment. Too much of one, too much of the other is a problem. In their foundational textbook for the field of reinforcement learning, which has gone through many editions, this I'm using the first edition. Um, Co-authors Richard Sutton and Andrew Bartow themselves the key developers of reinforcement learning algorithms and techniques, stress the importance of designing an agent's reward function carefully. The trick is to remember that the agent always learns to maximize its reward. If we want it to do something for us, we must provide rewards to it in such a way that in maximizing them, the agent will also achieve our goals. It is thus critical that the rewards we set up truly indicate what we want accomplished. The reward signal is your way of communicating to the agent what you want to what you want it to achieve, not how you want it achieved. Leaving space for creative solutions to the problem. If this design idea is is ignored and the programmer rewards the reinforcement agent for sub goal steps in the process, the agent might find a way to achieve them without achieving the real goal. And this is a phenomenon known as reward hacking. Norbert Wiener writing on some moral and technical consequences of automation in 1960, depicted reward hacking's danger through the Gollum figure of the sorcerer's apprentice warning that, 
quote, we had better be quite sure that the purpose put into the machine is the purpose which we really desire and not merely a colorful imitation of it. Wiener describes the problem of value alignment as vexed by temporal differences. Since man and machine operate on two distinct timescales, even more than they do on two distinct sets of values. So the timescale for the machine is one in which many things can happen in a short amount of time. Perhaps not so for the human. Wiener warns machine learning engineers that this process inaugurates a mechanical agency with whose operation we cannot efficiently interfere once we have started it because the action is so fast and irrevocable that we do not have the data to intervene before the action is complete. A two-player game involving a human and a machine thus decelerates this problem. Since the machine can only act once every other time step, it's obliged to take turns with its human counterpart. It has to wait. In this way, the machine becomes vulnerable in time to the velocity of human thought. Its learning takes place at our speed. In the context of reinforcement learning research, we might contrast the vulnerability of the learner to what computer scientists term brittleness in algorithms and AI. Brittleness is when the algorithm or agent works well in a narrow range of expected parameters, but is perturbed into uselessness, at the least unpredictability in its domain. How does the cognitive and emotional vulnerability of the learner compare to the malleability of the learner? What are the limits of this adequation? Brittleness in the learner designates when opportunities for growth, apprehension, change are missed or foreclosed, however temporarily. In the 19th century versions of the golem story, the golem's body is fashioned from riverbank clay. The golem takes shape from local environs. Here, the Vltava River in Prague, once upon a time known as the Moda. The golem is formed from this substance of boundaries, whatever the borders of the field have to spare, whatever grounds the structure, whatever is lying around. The golem thus represents the malleable. A golem is a Hebrew word meaning the unformed, the unformed. Yet as this parable moves across the centuries, this unformed and malleable creature starts to represent the literal minded, the unteachable, the malleable starts to figure the brittle. The golem as sorcerer's apprentice in the 19th century version and onward, allegorizes how unthinking iterations or ill-considered policies culminate in catastrophe precipitously shattering the bounds of its conceived domain of use, the clay and unformed golem paradoxically prefigures brittle artificial intelligence. Yet is this the golem's truth or is it merely our projection? Okay, games, reinforcement learning and optimal teaching. From the very beginning of machine learning research, board games such as chess, checkers, and backgammon offered important test cases for the development of machine learning. Tesoro's self-teaching backgammon program achieved human parity through Tesoro's applying Sutton's temporal difference TD algorithm to the training of a neural network through reinforcement learning. Tesoro's backgammon agent trained with supervised learning methods originally previously had won a championship against other computer programs, yet Tesoro found that a subsequent agent he trained using reinforcement learning methods had superior skills to the original model. This reinforcement learning agent had learned not by following humans and their policies, but by following the game itself as an environment with structured rewards. 
This pattern of training neural networks on gameplay, first, use, first using supervised learning and later turning the agent loose on the game without human models, is a pattern that has repeated frequently over the last decades and quite famously uh, recently, perhaps some of you have followed this. Um, one notable example comes from the developers at DeepMind uh, who departed from previous artificial agents trained on human expert play in the game of Go. This new agent, a deep convolutional neural network named AlphaGo, was trained not by humans, but by self-play using reinforcement learning methods. AlphaGo made headlines for beating the human Go champion, Lee Sedol, in 2016. The following year, DeepMind released AlphaZero, a general purpose learning agent that could beat all existing world champion computer programs, all existing world champion computer programs in chess, shogi, a uh, Japanese chess, and Go. Starting from zero, training only by playing against these programs, computer programs, Alpha Zero beat the chess champion program Stockfish after only four hours. The Shogi champion program it beat after only two hours. And then playing against the champion agent Alpha Go, Alpha Zero beat its own cousin after only eight hours of play. The reliance on gaming environments to benchmark the power of artificially intelligent agents has received wide support and resulted in a number of annual competitions. But what if machine learning that takes place in what Sutton and Bartow call the case of a game against nature, where an agent has neither human model nor external adversary? If Wiener had lived to see further developments in machine learning, his interest would no doubt have been piqued by developments in inverse reinforcement learning and cooperative inverse reinforcement learning, methods where the game of learning is considerably less predictable or structured. Inverse reinforcement learning was designed for situations in which an agent cannot learn a policy simply by maximizing a fixed reward function. Instead, it learns a reward function from its environment by observing the behavior of other experts. So it learns the reward function. Andrew Ng and Stuart Russell, they're listed original developers of inverse reinforcement learning, were guided by the general reinforcement learning axiom that sees reward functions as the most parsimonious description, uh, the most parsimonious of behavioral descriptions the most succinct, robust, and transferable definition of any task, however complex. While the rules of games are stated in advance, games against nature, and that's things like driving, walking, or fetching water from Prague's Latava River, as the golem was designed to do, possess no fixed or computable description. In games against nature, an agent must find ways to act optimally using incomplete information within an environment that's only partially known, like life. Cooperative inverse reinforcement learning supplements these strategies of learning amidst uncertainty with a new emphasis on the importance of pedagogy. So moving beyond mere imitation of experts simply feeling the environment out. Cooperative inverse reinforcement learning sees both the human and AI agent as operating within a noisy two-player game, a game that promotes interactive learning, not only on the part of the agent, the autonomous agent, um, the machine, but also on the part of the human player. Uh, the human player is incentivized in cooperative inverse reinforcement learning to act as a teacher rather than an expert. So rather than an expert modeler, the human needs to act as a teacher. What's the difference? The reward function of the game is known to the human, but unknown to the AI agent, so that as uh, listed on the screen, Hadfield, Manel et al. explain, the robot's payoff is exactly the human's actual reward. 
payoff with the robot, it's the same thing as report, the actual reward. Ensuring value alignment between what the human wants and what the robot actually does, cooperation. While inverse reinforcement learning trains agents to imitate an expert, cooperative inverse reinforcement learning incentivizes the human to teach, finding examples that optimally train a learner as opposed to simply modeling perfect behavior. So the examples that teach are not the same as perfect performance. Teachers and audience can think about this. This emphasis on optimal teaching takes efficient learning as its objective, even as it does not explicitly encode this learning into the interaction. Rather, efficient learning and optimal teaching co-emerge from the games being structured by asymmetric information, both parts, and a reward function that both players share. So not just the autonomous agent has a reward function, the human also. The key to cooperative inverse reinforcement learning's ongoing program of research is encouraging interactions with machinic agents where humans seek to act pedagogically rather than perfectly. By including the AI agent and human in the same game, on the same team, and reasoning about helping each other, according to the authors, even wide variances in actual human behavior won't prevent the AI from learning policies that align with humanity's, for example, best interests. Okay, so final, final section here, the Golem's game. While testing AI agents on games in controlled environments like Go or chess may demonstrate AI's prodigious intelligence, techniques like cooperative inverse reinforcement learning prepare today's AI golems for something closer to the world's really noisy game. Games that matter. Games that do not possess a complete theory, as Wiener wrote. Uh, Wiener adds to this, a game that does not possess a complete theory. Neither do war, nor business competition, nor any of the forms of competitive activity in which we are really interested. Wiener saw how even the earliest machine learning agents quickly escaped from the control of their inventors by means of their adversarial originality. They adopt the persona and the behavior of their human opponents so they can beat them. Moreover, owing to the slow processing speeds of the human brain, humanity's ability to know precisely when to switch off its artificially intelligent learning machines is biologically compromised. As Wiener explains, scientists themselves can only work as a part of a process whose time scale is so long that the scientists comprehend only a very limited sector of it. Wiener calls this interrelation between human scientists and AI agents two parts of a double machine. Two parts of a double machine. This double machine has a relation in which reciprocal understanding between the two parts, the two parties, is predominantly foreclosed. Unknowability defines this. Even when science intends to contribute to human ends, in quotes. Wiener cautions that scientists' belief in their ability to ensure the beneficial outcome for humanity needs a continual scanning and reevaluation, an effort that itself is only partly possible. Within this noisy, co evolving double machine, one glimpses a possible scenario in which the valence of reinforcement learning would maybe be reversed. We could imagine here a learning process in which machines themselves might perform optimal teaching with respect to their intellectually voracious human designers. Wiener's rendition of the Gollum story allows for this double valence to this thought experiment. And here, remind us again of the Gollum 
who emerges only to instruct in what next to do, how to fix the problem. Uh, suggesting that the golem's task as a creature may not primarily be to learn, but rather to challenge, to instruct humans in those risks they take on with each advance in their creative powers. <laughs> 